Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the past few videos, we've been talking a lot about inflammation and atherosclerosis, two things that are very closely intertwined. And one of the things we also need to talk about are these things called advanced glycation end products or ages. Now, to put it really simply, these are molecules that are formed whenever a protein gets ligated chemically, or we could say covalently bound, to a molecule of glucose. And so these ages that are going to form have the potential to cause damage to cells, and they can also contribute to atherosclerosis. So we're going to talk about, first of all, how they're formed, and then also some of the biological effects that they have. So right here I have a protein, and this amino acid residue coming off of it, this is a lysine. This is the most common amino acid that can be glycated. And this molecule down here, this is glucose. Now glucose has three major forms. Uh, the two most prominent ones are the cyclic forms. This one over here on the left is the alpha isomer, and over here on the right is the beta. Notice that they form a ring, so it's cyclic. Uh, the beta form 64%, alpha constitutes 36, and there's a very, very, very small concentration of this linear or straight chain form, sometimes called acyclic because it doesn't form a ring. And really, in biological systems, the alpha and beta isomers are constantly interconverting between one another. Okay? But in order for the alpha isomer, let's say, to get to the beta, it has to first decyclize into the linear form, and then it can recyclize into the beta isomer. So at any given time, it's a very small amount, but there is some concentration of this acyclic or linear form of glucose. And it turns out that this aldehyde functional group over here, which is labeled as position one, is very reactive, particularly to uh, the amino acid lysine right here. And so what you see is this amino acid lysine, this lone pair on the nitrogen, can nucleophilically attack the carbon of that aldehyde. And this actually forms a covalent bond. Okay? And the next step is we're going to have this shift base formation. A shift base is really just a nitrogen-carbon double bond like you see here. Now, over here in the second uh, molecule, this nitrogen-carbon single bond is not as stable. And so what happens is, is you get a double bond formation, uh, which results in the loss of this OH group as water. So this is an elimination reaction. It does not require an enzyme, nor do any of these steps require an enzyme. These are things that happen spontaneously. And so with the elimination of this hydroxyl as water, we get the formation of this shift base. The last step is the amidory rearrangement. Uh, we won't go into the mechanism here, but basically there's a double bond that rearranges. Now we have a nitrogen-carbon single bond, carbon-oxygen double bond, and this form over here is the most stable of all of these. Okay? Now what do we have essentially here? We now have this moiety, which basically was glucose. We're going to consider it glucose. It's a different form of it. But now it's chemically bonded to this protein, meaning this protein has now become glycated. Now, why is this relevant? Well, number one, this molecule right here, this form of the protein that's now bound to the glucose molecule, it's not going to have an easy time reversing and going the other direction. It's very improbable that, that will happen. So you're pretty much stuck like this. And number two, this molecule right here where we have a protein glucose adduct, this is termed an advanced glycation end product or an age. It's termed that because now we have this protein that's been glycated. Now, there is glucose in the blood at any given time. Every single person has blood glucose. That's what our cells run on, right? And so with normal healthy blood glucose in a healthy individual, this process happens to a small extent. But there are mechanisms in place within the body to get rid of these advanced glycation end products. And so you're really able to keep them at bay. These ages are always forming to some extent in our bodies. Okay? It's just the extent of their formation that dictates health versus disease. Think about it. We all have blood glucose, right? 
and a, a normal resting, or I should say fasting value, should be somewhere between 70 and 100 or 80 and 110 milligrams per deciliter, right? Uh, and when that's a low value like that or a healthy value, the amount of ages that form are very small. And they're so small, in fact, that they're not really going to produce harmful effects in the body, and there are mechanisms within the body to get rid of them. However, it's when their production becomes excessive that you exceed the body's ability to get rid of them, and then you start seeing their accumulation, and then you see physiological effects. What condition would you have this in where they start accumulating? Well, it's any condition where there's a lot of blood glucose hyperglycemia, in particular chronic hyperglycemia, and that's what we see in individuals who consume high sugar diets. So excess sugar in the blood, you have excess glycation of proteins, and now you've got an accumulation of these advanced glycation end products. Hopefully their formation now makes sense to you. Let's look and see what their biological effects are. And we're really going to look at two major pathways here that will help explain some of their effects in the body. Now, first of all, I want to mention this. There's a receptor here that's going to be present on certain immune cells, like this one. This is a macrophage, and in their plasma membrane, they have this protein called RAGE. RAGE stands for Receptor of Advanced Glycation End Product. Uh, they could have called it the Advanced Glycation End Product Receptor, but RAGE flows off the tongue a lot easier. And so these Advanced Glycation End Products um, can bind to this protein. And when they do, it activates certain pathways inside the cell. And you get different biological effects. The first pathway we're going to look at is the NOx pathway. And NOx is a membrane-bound protein called NADPH phagosome oxidase, NOx. So what we see right here, here's the enzyme NOx, NADPH phagosome oxidase. This enzyme is the committed step in reactive oxidative species synthesis. We have an entire pathway for that. But in order for this enzyme to become activated, uh, this age has to bind to its receptor, the rage. And when that happens, there's an intracellular signaling cascade that occurs, and ultimately you get the activation of NOx, NADPH phagosome oxidase. And what this enzyme does is it catalyzes the irreversible conversion of molecular oxygen O2 into the superoxide radical over here. Okay? Now superoxide in and of itself is a free radical, it is a reactive oxidative species. Um, however, superoxide can be converted to hydrogen peroxide by this enzyme, superoxide dismutase. Now hydrogen peroxide is not a free radical, but it is a reactive oxidative species. Okay? Now hydrogen peroxide um, can react in one of two ways. Here, uh, number one, it can react with this enzyme catalase. Catalase is known as a protective enzyme because it degrades hydrogen peroxide. Um, and so catalase will get rid of hydrogen peroxide by converting it into water and molecular oxygen, both of which are relatively harmless. But also, this hydrogen peroxide can react with iron in the 2 plus state. This is ferrous iron. And this can cause hydrogen peroxide uh, to be reduced into a molecule of water and also this OH radical. This is called a hydroxyl radical. Now, hydroxyl radicals are extremely dangerous. These are so dangerous because they're so reactive. They're the most reactive of any of the reactive oxidative species that we have. These hydroxyl radicals uh, can damage membrane lipids, they can damage DNA, they can damage proteins, and they can cause cellular damage. Uh, in addition, they can also oxidize and damage LDL particles, so your low-density lipoproteins. The point is they cause a horrendous amount of damage, especially when their production is excessive. Additionally, superoxide and hydrogen peroxide can cause those same things. It's just that the hydroxyl radicals are much more reactive. Ultimately, what you see here is the activation of this NOx enzyme is going to lead to the production of all three of those things, superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, and hydroxyl radicals. And what led to that? Well, it's the production of advanced glycation end products through this pathway. And so what we see here is by having these advanced glycation end products, we activate the NOx pathway, which gives us reactive oxidative species. And one of the things that I did mention is that can actually result in the oxidation of low-density lipoproteins. And remember that when they become oxidized, we term those um, LDL ox. It's also worth mentioning that these LDLs can also be glycated 
by glucose in the same way that we saw at the start of this video. And so a glycated LDL can also itself be an advanced glycation end product, which can also activate this receptor. And so it can sort of move in a vicious cycle like this. Obviously, oxidized LDLs contribute to atherosclerosis because they are going to be uptaken by macrophages, which causes them to release inflammatory cytokines, differentiate into foam cells, and you get that whole pathology that we talked about in the previous video. Okay, so that's one pathway. The second we're going to talk about is that of NF-kappa B. So let's actually go to that right now. Now, uh, we have the advanced glycation end product, right? We know that binds to its receptor RAGE. And from here, RAGE can indirectly activate NF-kappa B, which is shown over here. Let's go here. RAGE is going to activate this protein called IKK. IKK is a kinase, meaning it phosphorylates certain proteins. We have this complex over here of I-kappa B alpha. I-kappa B alpha is an inhibitory part of this complex. It inhibits the function of real A and P50. Now, real A and P50, these two proteins combined are actually NF-kappa B, which we'll see in a minute. But as long as I-kappa B alpha is bound to these two proteins, it keeps them inhibited. So when RAGE activates IKK, IKK phosphorylates I-kappa B alpha. You see that right here. I-kappa B alpha now has these phosphate groups attached, which causes it to lose its vice grip on rel A and P50, and it floats away. And in fact, it becomes degraded via the proteasomal pathway. That leaves a free rel A and P50, and collectively these two proteins are this NF-kappa B. Now, NF-kappa B itself is a transcription factor. So what you see is it comes into the nucleus here through the nuclear pore complex and binds to specific elements on the DNA. It, of course, requires other proteins like a co-activator here in green and in red here, RNA polymerase. But of course, uh, it's going to recruit RNA polymerase to a target gene and results in its transcription to mRNA. And then the mRNA leaves the nucleus into the cytoplasm where it's picked up by ribosomes and translated into a protein, which of course has some function. The question is, what are those proteins? Well, think about our context here. We have an advanced glycation end product, which is activating RAGE. Do you think it's going to be pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory? Well, it's going to be pro-inflammatory. So what you see here is the advanced glycation end product binds to RAGE and it's going to ultimately activate this NF-kappa B pathway, which changes gene expression and results in the production of inflammatory cytokines. Now, there's a whole host of these kinds of proteins that are generated, and there's too many to really go into the function of here. But basically, these inflammatory cytokines are going to have some important functions here. One, they're going to recruit other immune cells to the area. They're also going to trigger the production of all sorts of other inflammatory molecules. And other than this production of oxidized LDL that we saw before, these inflammatory cytokines are going to contribute to that inflammation and also contribute to the progression of that atherosclerosis, again, that we talked about in the previous video. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of what advanced glycation end products are and some of the pathways, not all of them, of course, but some of them that lead uh, to this chronic inflammation that we have and that's going to contribute to atherosclerosis. If you want more information on atherosclerosis, go back and watch some of the previous videos in this playlist. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.